on maximal Cohen Macaulay modules, which form one of the uh, subtopics, I guess, of the workshop. And this is um, nothing I'm going to say today is my own work. This is all what you might call classical uh, and relatively elementary. So please do stop if I say something that uh, seems completely strange. Um, so for all of today, I'm going to work over a commutative ring. commutative local ring, the unique maximal ideal, R. And so let's go ahead and define what a maximal Cohen Macaulay module is. So A, let's say non-zero, finitely generated R module is I go directly to the abbreviation MCM, Maximal Cohen Macaulay. If, and there are several ways to do this, I'm going to take the uh, most compact and least revealing <coughs> and then try to explain what it means. X I of R mod M. What is little m? m is the unique maximal ideal. X to I of the residue field into our module is 0 for I from 0 up to the dimension of our ring minus 1. And here dimension, I mean curl dimension. So as I say, this is the most compact, but Maybe a little mysterious. So let me say a few things uh, to try to explain what it means. I'll give you two other ways to think about this. One is that to this module you can associate an invariant called its depth, which is just the first non-vanishing of these exts. So the first index at which that x is non-zero, well, this says that that is d, which is going to be my name for the crawl dimension which is the maximal possible. So these are extremal modules in a particular sense. This invariant is as large as it could possibly be. But if you don't know depth before you see this sentence, then the sentence doesn't help you very much. Here's another equivalent characterization uh, in a special case. So let's assume that R is either complete local, so say, for example, a quotient of a power series ring over a field, or um, let's say essentially a finite type. over a field, in which case it contains a power series or polynomial, well, localized polynomial, ring T, over which it's finite as a module.
all of that is parenthetical. That's the setup for the special case. And then I did just leave myself enough room to say what the equivalent condition is. It is that M is finitely generated free over this subring T. It's what sometimes gets called a, a lattice over the ring R. In particular, uh, let me make sure I didn't leave anything out. Oh, let me say one more thing. So this MCM property is a kind of um, torsion freeness. And I'll say more to justify that claim in a moment. But m notice, for example, that uh, this vanishing here for, for the first value, for i equals 0, this vanishing says that the socle of m is trivial. So it has at least no torsion in that sense. And as a special case, let's talk about the ring R itself. If the ring R itself is a maximal Cohen Macaulay module over itself, let's say that it is a Cohen Macaulay ring. And I'm going to focus on Cohen Macaulay rings. Uh, essentially for all of today. So let's talk a little about them. This is, um, there's a famous paper of Bass that, you know, the ubiquity of Gorenstein rings, but every Gorenstein ring is Cohen Macaulay. So Cohen Macaulay rings are even more ubiquitous than ubiquitous things. So let's, a few examples. Oops. Um, Example zero, let's talk about small dimensions. Um, any zero dimensional local ring, so I mean Artinian, is automatically Cohen Macaulay. So we get, for example, all finitely, finitely generated. Uh, excuse me, all finite dimensional algebras over a field, all of mine are commutative, of course. Uh, those are all Cohen Macaulay. Um, a one dimensional, um, not all one dimensional rings are Cohen Macaulay, but any one dimensional domain. So this means, for example, um, the coordinate ring of a of an irreducible curve is Cohen Macaulay. Up one more step. In dimension two, a um, again, not every two dimensional ring is Cohen Macaulay, but a normal domain. is always Cole Macaulay in dimension two. So as you see, these are getting a little more, a uh, little rarer as we go up, but still quite a mild assumption. Third, um, a regular local ring. So the um, coordinate ring of a smooth point on an algebraic variety is Cohen Macaulay. In fact, even a complete intersection ring is Cohen 
Macaulay. So all of these rings that you may have run across all qualify. And finally, just to get one actual theorem up, um, any ring of invariance <coughs> under either finite groups acting or uh, linearly reductive, linearly reductive algebraic groups. Those are all Cohen Macaulay. And this one's a theorem of Hoxter and Roberts. From 74, maybe? Yes, 74. So these are the rings I'm talking about today. And now let's talk for a moment about the Cohen Macaulay modules over Cohen Macaulay rings. By the way, as, as, as has become sort of standard, I'm going to say Cohen-Macaulay when I mean maximal Cohen-Macaulay. I'm not talking about any other kind of Cohen-Macaulay. So let's think about examples of the Cohen-Macaulay modules over Cohen-Macaulay rings. And again, let's track small dimensions just to make sure We have good intuition at the lower levels. Uh, over an Artinian ring, any finitely generated module they're all maximal Cohen Macaulay. So combining like, that example zero with that this example zero, you see that Cohen Macaulay modules encompass all of module theory over <coughs> finite dimensional algebras, commutative finite dimensional algebras. Over one dimensional domains, uh, Colin Macaulay means torsion free. So this is the first basis for, or maybe second, for justifying my statement here that it's a kind of torsion freeness. For one dimensional domains, it's exactly torsion freeness. And for two dimensional normal domains, it's a little more. Um, Torsion or Cohen Macaulay modules are reflexive. So I mean that they are isomorphic to their double dual into the ring. So here the star means the algebraic dual into the ring. So as we go along, we get more and more torsion freeness. How about example three, regular local rings? This is where something interesting actually starts to happen. This is where we start to see one reason for studying Cohen-Macaulay modules, apart from their uh, the max, the uh, extremal property. We see that they start to have some homological information. So over regular local rings, smooth points, Cohen-Macaulay modules are free. They're the only maximal Cohen-Macaulay modules, the free ones. 
And in fact, the converse holds as well. So vice versa, meaning if every maximal Cohen Macaulay module is free, R is regular. And this follows from something I'm going to need later, so I'll go ahead and state it now. The Auslander Buchsbaum formula. which says if M is a module of finite projective dimension, over a local ring R, then the depth of the module plus the projective dimension of the module is the depth of the ring. And so now we see that the example above follows directly from this because M is maximal Cohen Macaulay, this is D. This side is also D, and so the projective dimension must be zero. Um, <coughs> so that gives a first approximation to an answer to the question, why should we study Cohen-Macaulay modules? They carry some homological information. They dictate the regularity of the ring, or their, their absence dictates the regularity of the ring. Um, let me give you one more at the airport, Ryo Takahashi was saying that he gave a lecture on Cohen-Macaulay modules where someone in the audience challenged him, why should I care about Cohen-Macaulay modules? So I went home and rewrote my talk. So it's just answers to that question. I don't know if I have good answers, but these are the answers I have. Let me tell you about the homological conjectures. And there are two groups of things, two classes of things that I might mean by the homological conjectures. I mean the ones in commutative algebra rather than in non-commutative algebra. So this is a collection, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so conjectures. due to, let's see, Auslander. Oh, she said we could take <coughs> these off. Auslander, Serre, Bass, Pasquin, Spiro. And especially Hoxter. Hoxter and some others, which at first glance, don't appear to have much to do with Cohen-Macaulay modules. So let me give you a couple of examples. Oh, I was going to say, from the, let's say, 60s to the 90s. So, for example, there's Auslander's zero divisor conjecture, <coughs> which is if <coughs> M has finite projective dimension, <coughs> and Z 
is a non-zero divisor. That's not how I want that. Non-zero divisor. On M, then also on R. So this is for an arbitrary local ring R. And M doesn't have to be Colin Macaulay here. This is an arbitrary finitely generated module over our local ring. Or there's Bass's question. That is, if um, a local ring R admits a finitely generated module of finite injective dimension, then R is Cohen Macaulay. I should have dates on these, but I didn't write them down. Sorry. And thirdly, last one I'll give you. The new intersection theorem, or new intersection conjecture, <coughs> of Pesquin and Spiro, which says that, oops, I've lost it, there it is. If we let zero to F, I can't read that, it's a little dim, FK up to F zero be a complex of finitely generated free modules. some local ring with homology of finite length. And if k, the length of this complex, is less than the dimension of r, then it's exact. homology is in fact zero. So there are three of the homological conjectures. As I say, there are a bunch more, things like the canonical element conjecture, the direct sum and conjecture, Serre's conjectures on intersection multiplicities. And many of them, I'm not going to write this part, I'm just going to talk. Many of them are known to have positive answers uh, by work of Pesquin Spiro uh, in the case where the ring contains a field, uh, then by work of Paul Roberts, uh, using some very serious K-theory. The point that I want to make about them here today is that the mere existence of a maximal Cohen-Macaulay module even an infinitely generated one a so-called big Cohen Macaulay module which I'm not going to talk about at all uh, but ex existence of a maximal Cohen Macaulay module gives a positive answer all of these. These questions which appear to have nothing to do with Cohen-Macaulay modules on the face of them, uh, in fact, follow from existence of Cohen-Macaulay modules. And so, for example, Hoxter has conjectured that any complete local ring has a maximal Cohen-Macaulay module, and therefore that all these conjectures hold for complete local rings. Uh, that's still open. Uh, yeah. So that's one reason to care. Maybe I'm up to two or three reasons. Here is 
my last reason to care, which will take the rest of my time. And let me go ahead and say this is the main reason I care. is that they are an appropriate place to do representation theory. So let me explain what I mean by that and try to justify it. Here's a theorem of Bass. Uh, and I think I wrote the year down. No, I didn't write the year down. Sometime in the 60s. Bass proved that if a local ring R has what you would like to call finite representation type, so has, well, let me say it like this, finite representation type, with respect to all modules, all finitely generated modules, so by this I mean has only finitely many uh, non-isomorphic indecomposable finitely generated modules, then R is Artinian. So what this means from my point of view is finite representation type with respect to all finitely generated modules is far too strong an assumption. You get only trivial examples in this sense. So if you want to talk about finite representation type for local rings that aren't necessarily zero dimensional, you need a different class. So I therefore say that a local ring R has finite CM representation type which I abbreviate as FCMT as follows if <coughs> it has finite representation type with respect to the Cohen Macaulay modules. So specifically, if it has <coughs> only finitely many isoclasses of indecomposable maximal Cohen Macaulay modules. Of course, we don't yet, we haven't yet justified my claim here that this is an appropriate class of modules, but at least we know from Bass that we have to do something. So this is what I'm proposing. So let's again consider low dimensions. So example zero, as previously, is Artinian rings. An Artinian <coughs> local ring has finite Cohen Macaulay type if and only if it is a principal ideal ring. 
And remember, all my rings are commutative, so this there are many fewer examples for commutative rings than non-commutative ones. Principal ideal ring means something of the form k bracket t mod t to the n, or the integers mod a prime to a power. And in these cases, the Cohen-Macaulay modules are just the uh, further quotients by other powers of t or other powers of p. So the commutative situation is much simpler. in dimension zero. By the way, combining that example with this theorem of Bass, you can sharpen Bass's theorem a little bit. If a local ring has finite representation type with respect to all finitely generated modules, then it's a principal ideal ring. Okay, but so now here's the real test. Uh, are these Cohen-Macaulay modules a reasonable class in dimensions other than zero. So let's let R be a one-dimensional domain. As previously in examples one. <coughs> then R has this finite representation type property if and only if it satisfies what are sometimes now called the Droz Reuter conditions. Which I don't want to spend too much time digging into. They're a little bit technical, but I can still write them down. The first is that the multiplicity of R is at most three. So if you're thinking geometrically, this of course means the multiplicity of the uh, singularity. It's at most three. And the second one's a little weird. It is that um, the maximal ideal extended to the integral closure plus the ring, mod modulo the ring, is a cyclic R module. Cyclic. R module, where this R bar is the normalization. Uh, one, of one observes that in this situation, R bar is a finitely generated R module, uh, or it could have, or it won't have finite Cohen Macaulay type. In any case, there are these two relatively easy to check conditions and a relatively small class of rings that have finite Cohen macaulay type and yet uh, many, for example, things like power series in T cubed, T fourth, and T fifth, one checks right away. The multiplicity is this three here and this is an easy calculation. dimension two. This is really where the story gets good. I do need a couple more assumptions. Let me make sure I get them all. <coughs> so this is a theorem of Auslander. To the effect that a complete Equicharacteristic, well, let me just spell out what that means, a complete local ring containing a field of dimension two has finite Cohen Macaulay type. if and only if it's of the form p 
power series in two variables, say u and v, and then take invariance by a finite subgroup. of GL2K. Uh, one direction of this actually was known previously. 86 can't be right. <coughs> ah, right, sorry, 78. Um, one direction, that is the, the fact that all of these rings have finite Colin Macaulay type is due to Herzog in 78. But the classification, the fact that those are the only ones is due to Auslander. And this theorem is the, um, the starting point of what gets called the, well, not the starting point, it's a, a uh, crescendo somewhere in the middle of the Mackay correspondence, about which I don't get to say anything today, which is sort of sad. I love talking about Mackay correspondence. Uh, to close this little rundown of examples of finite Cohen Macaulay type, let me just say, third, um, <coughs> in curl dimensions at least three, there are only two examples known. Well, that's a lie, but there are only two examples. of local rings of finite Cohen Macaulay type known that are not hypersurfaces. These are both due to Auslander and Wrighton, and they are both uh, three-dimensional in particular, there are no examples known in dimension four that aren't hypersurfaces. I don't think anyone has ever been bold enough to write down a conjecture to the effect that there aren't any. People just don't have any idea, I think. So that um, this ab undermines a bit my claim that uh, maximal Cohen Macaulay modules are an appropriate place to do representation theory because we run out. <laughs> Uh, though perhaps there's, there are still 26 sporadic rings of Cohen Macaulay type, finite Cohen Macaulay type out there somewhere, somewhere, just to pick a random number. Okay. So now a couple of um, general theorems on finite Cohen Macaulay type <coughs> due to Auslander. This is where I hope to shore back up this claim that uh, doing representation theory with these modules <coughs> is a good idea. So I'll present them in reverse chronological order. Though at this time there were so many papers and theorems in the mid to late 80s on this topic that it's hard to know what came first. I assume there was a significant lag in the publication of all of them. But the first one I want to mention is that a Cohen Macaulay local ring of finite Cohen Macaulay type has at most an isolated singularity. So I mean any localization away from the maximal ideal is a regular local ring, or the geometric gadget corresponding has an isolated singularity. Uh, Auslander proved it in the complete case. Uh, Yoshino proved it in the Hensel Henselian case. Craig Hunicke and I uh, proved the statement here. We're going to restrict to isolated singularities in a few minutes. And really, I think 
the, my claim should have been Cohen Macaulay modules are a good place to do representation theory over isolated singularities. And here's the other one. This should really bolster my claim. How do I want to say this? Let's say maximal <coughs> Cohen Macaulay modules over Cohen Macaulay isolated singularities. have almost split sequences. So the tools developed in for finite dimensional algebras, for Artinian, for Artin algebras, for AR theory can be applied in this situation. And of course, combining the two, you get um, almost split sequences for rings of finite Cohen Macaulay type. So these two together lead to what I'm going to go ahead and call the um, flagship, sure, why not, flagship result of the Ragnar is sitting in the front row, so I'll compliment him with this one and then insult him a little with this one. The classical period of Cohen Macaulay representation theory which is the classification of hypersurface rings. explain what that is. 50 minutes? Yeah, good. So this is a result due to Buchweitz, Groyl, Schreier, and Knorr. In 87, let's let uh, K be a field of characteristic zero, and let's let um, R be power series ring in D plus one variables modulo a single equation F. So R is a complete hypersurface singularity ring. Have I forgotten any hypotheses? I don't think so. Oh, well, with F F should be in the, s in the square of the ideal generated by the x's. So, so R is not a regular local ring. Then the following three statements are equivalent. <coughs> Bless you. First, that R has finite Cohen Macaulay type. Second, that R or F 
is a simple singularity in the sense of Arnold, which I won't define, but you can take the third statement as the definition, if you like. The third is R is isomorphic to power series in X and Y and some variable Z, Z2 up to ZD, modulo a single equation of the form a polynomial in X <coughs> and Y plus the squares of everybody else. Where this polynomial G of XY is one of the following short list which are indexed by Dinkin diagrams. E6, E7, and E8. So they are x cubed plus y to the fourth, x <coughs> cubed plus xy squared, and x cubed plus y to the fifth. Um, yes, yes. Thanks. Did I get E7? See, I, I didn't bring my old man glasses, so I can't actually read what I wrote here. <laughs> ah, x cubed plus xy cubed. Thanks. And in the last couple of minutes, I'll just say that um, part of the proof of this, the part uh, due to Knurr, is the fact, the uh, what sometimes gets called Knurr's periodicity <coughs> theorem, that if there weren't any Zs, each of these has finite Cohen Macaulay type, and adding <coughs> the sum of these squares does not change the Cohen Macaulay type. So I think rather than rush to write that, I will just quit here. Thank you for listening.